from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working with students and families to improve college access and student success for a better West Virginia. Good evening and welcome to the Legislature Today. I'm Andrea Lanham at the West Virginia Capitol Building. Tonight we're joined by Democratic leadership of both houses for their response to the Governor's State of the State Address last night. With me are Senate Minority Leader Roman Prezioso and House Minority Leader Tim Miley. Thank you both for joining me this evening. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks for having, for having us. us. The Governor's Address last night provided us with a message of optimism that repeatedly pointed back to the state's dire economic outlook just one year ago. It was nearly 50 minutes long, unscripted, and characteristically included posters and visual aids, and even some cheering by a girls basketball team. Reporter Dave Mistich starts us off with the highlights. In his typically casual tone, Justice began his address with a joke about the temperature outside the Capitol, as well as that inside the House chamber. How can it be 65 degrees or whatever outside right now and 85 in my office and whatever it is in here? But uh, let's just hope this, that this is the hottest it gets in here for the next 60 days. Such a comment comes after a divisive session last year and an extended budget impasse while Justice was still a Democrat before switching back to the Republican Party last August. While last year's session was marked by budgetary issues that almost forced a government shutdown, Justice spent much of this year's speech describing a more hopeful economic prognosis. Early on in his speech, however, he did address continued problems related to opioid addiction. We have to stop. We have to stop this terrible drug epidemic. We have to. If we don't, it will cannibalize us. You know, just recently we had to dispatch the National Guard to Huntington to try to stop the terrible shootings that were going on in Huntington. You know, we know we have to, be, we have to build treatment facilities or we have to have additional social workers or we have to do additional law enforcement. Do we not? Of course we do. In a nod to the fiscal strains of 2017, Justice pulled out platters for the leadership of both parties. Except these platters were not covered in bull manure, like the one he unveiled last year before vetoing a budget bill. I've got four of these that we're delivering. <laughs> and we're delivering to our speaker and our president and Tim Miley and Roman Prezioso. Now, they're a little bit different. If you'll open them up, and I got one for myself because I didn't think they'd give me one. It's got a big giant Hershey kiss. It's got a wonderful WVU or West Virginia type boutonniere. And it's got an eight track tape that says happy days. As expected, Justice also mentioned economic possibilities announced last fall with China Energy, which has been touted as a potential $83.7 billion investment in the natural gas and petrochemical industries. It could really happen. And the reason it could probably happen is two things. And these are Trump cards that we have, and they're true Trump cards. President Trump genuinely wants the trade imbalance with China to change. And President Trump has put his first step foot forward to say a big part of that change is going to happen in West Virginia. And I'll promise you, President Trump and I are friends, and President Trump doesn't want me calling him saying, Donald, why isn't it happening? In looking forward to this session and the forthcoming budget, Justice noted that the state's the revenues stand above projections for the first time in five today. years. With that in mind, Justice says his proposed budget would more than triple the Division of Tourism's funding from $6 million to $20 million annually. For every dollar that flows into tourism, it is unbelievable the multiplier effect that comes right back to us. We have got to market ourselves. 
At some point in time, you've got to get tired of waking up and watching the TV and watching the TV say, come to New York or come to Michigan. It's driving me crazy. Justice also proposed a 1% pay raise for all state employees, as well as an additional bump for teachers that would amount to 5% over five years. Other priorities for justice include making community and technical colleges free and also increasing agricultural industries across the state. Establishing a new acronym, Justice also noted a proposed repeal of the state's business inventory tax, which he hopes will also spur on new economic activity. I don't very often get to name something. You guys are famous for naming something like CL9623BC. And I don't have a clue what that ever means. But I'm going to call something JCTAW. And it's going to stand for Just Cut Taxes and Win. In closing, and again touching on an extended metaphor of his governorship serving as coach of West Virginia, Justice invited the Greenbrier East girls basketball team to the floor for a cheer. Best, they screamed with justice, telling West Virginians to think of themselves as the best. It was a message of optimism that he hopes can be a theme of the legislative session. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Dave Mistich at the Capitol. Once again, joining us for the minority response to last night's speech are Senate Minority Leader Roman Prezioso and House Minority Leader Tim Miley. Senator, let's begin with you. So before we get into any specifics on some of the issues that the governor touched on last night, um, it doesn't seem like Democrats are very optimistic. We're not out of the woods yet. No, we're not. And uh, the governor gave a unique speech last night, uh, one that I haven't seen from several governors in the past. And he has his own unique style. And he, he gave more of a raw, raw speech, uh, uh, a coach type speech to get us, you know, uh, revved up for the session. Well, I believe that we're ready, we're here and we're ready to go. We didn't hear a lot of particulars in this speech. He gave us an overview of where we were and where we are now. Uh, so we're putting the pieces together as Democrats to find out, fill in those blanks to be sure that all the initiatives, which we basically agree with, you know, those have been democratic issues for, for uh, you know, the last three decades. We want pay raises for our teachers and corrections officers and things of that sort, you know. Uh, uh, we want to increase money in tourism. We want to go out and, you know, showcase our state. So all the issues that the governor, you know, brought forth were very encouraging and we, and we agree with that. But the devil then is in the detail. We've got to pay for these things. And he said, no new tax increases. My number one question is, from last year in February, when he made his first speech, we were in the black, we were anticipated to be $400 million uh, behind in general revenues, to this year, we're, we're you know, we're, 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 we're well again. What transpired during that 11 month period that we got, you know, in such a really good position? And in a position where we've heard from you know, his people in his administrative offices, they were going to have a very slow growth into the future with, with our severance taxes, <clears throat> with our uh, income taxes, with our sales tax. So where are we getting this abundance of money for 5% pay raises for teachers, $20 million in tourism, and the list goes on and on. So those will be questions that we're asking. I hope that we're not being portrayed as being negative, but you know, we came here to work. We hope the temperature is 90 degrees every day because we work better in that environment. Delegate, what are some of your concerns? Well, my concerns are, uh, Andrea, <clears throat> that there's a, a lot of optimism with little to no facts or math to justify it. Look, I'm a, I'm a half glass half full kind of optimis optimistic guy myself, but I, it ha optimism must be sprinkled with a dose of reality and, and, and substance and information to justify some of the promises that were made last night. So, you know, some of the things he addressed and his initiatives we absolutely will support. They're good things for the state. 
But at the end of the day, you have to pay for all of those promises that were made. And to me, the worst thing you can do is, is raise the hopes of West Virginians only to find that at the end of the legislative session, very few of the promises have been fulfilled. And so the lack of detail is what causes me the greatest concern. And I understand that sometimes you don't know all the details at the present time, but my goodness, he certainly should have shared some of those details last night, and he didn't. And I don't know if that's because he just chose not to or because they're not really there to justify everything he wants to do. Now, the governor made a point last night saying that he wants to work with anyone, even Democrats. As you start this se at this session, um, is there still a sting from him switching parties, and especially how he did it in such a dramatic fashion? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that one, I suppose. Look, I've always said very publicly, we will support Governor Justice's initiatives and policies if they're good ones, and we'll oppose them and fight him tooth, toe, and nail if they're bad ones. I, I don't care whether he's a Democrat or Republican governor. Um, the sting, quite frankly, came last year before he even switched parties. So that's all in the past. You know, it was his first year as governor. Things didn't go as smoothly as, for, as, as, as he thought they should have. Um, Today is a new day. This is a new session, and we hope to work together. But it doesn't mean we're not going to hold him accountable for everything he wants to do that's, that's bad. Um, and we're going to hold him accountable for not doing things for the citizens that we think he ought to be doing. And I know you had mentioned that the governor had given kind of an unconventional speech, especially with his props. So my question is, who gets the Hershey kiss? Well, I guess we all do. And I, maybe that was a peace offering. But, you know, <laughs> he doesn't have to come to us with a peace offering. We, we're willing to work, and the, the Senate works hard. Uh, we've got, you know, 12 senators over here that are truly interested in seeing West Virginia grow. So we're, we're, we're hitting the road running. And the governor said no new taxes this year. Is that reasonable with all this new spending? Well, it, it, you know, I hope he's right about that. And, and you know, we're going to find out if he is. I just don't see with the way the economy is growing. He's put a lot of emphasis on coal. You know, even his administration thinks that, you know, this may be just a, a little blip that we get now. Uh, the weather's cold. There's going to be a need for our natural resources. As we get into summer, we, we you know, we, we're not seeing that severance tax line item grow as it should be. And, you know, they're behind schedule now. As, as you look at the uh, general revenue budget and what they projected, they're, they're behind on the severance taxes. Uh, we got a little blip in the income tax. You know, that was because of the anomaly with uh, the federal government income tax package. Uh, people filed their income, income taxes early. You know, they weren't due January the 15th, but a lot of people filed it in uh, year 217. And, uh, you know, that's going to be more reflective in the, in the July, in the January budget. To, uh, a more true picture of where, where the finances are going to go. So we suspect that he's not going to be able to meet his end needs without uh, generating some revenue. Now, both finance committees, the House and Senate, heard from the revenue secretary and heard some of the budget numbers. Are you guys comfortable with this six year projection where they say that there's surpluses in every year? It's, it's a projection. If you looked at it, we're, we're going to be ahead this year, $23 million, and then maybe next year, $200. They're making projections, and they've done that for years. A lot of times they've been spot on, but I've been here, you know, within the last 10 years. We've, they're, they haven't met their projections, so we're not sure that they're, they're on track. They can only estimate and guesstimate what it's going to be, you know. We, we, we're going to have to glean those numbers um, more rigorously. Now, another thing I wanted to discuss with you guys is the business inventory tax. The governor has mentioned this, and legislative leadership has said that this is something that they want to get done. And this is about $20 million each year for seven years. Do you know if there will be any revenue generated to replace that, especially to make the counties whole? Well, they claim that to get rid of the inventory tax and the uh, equipment tax, will cost the state, which means it costs the counties $140 million. And their proposal, as I understand it, is to, do, is to phase it out over seven years, um, $20 million a year. Well, to begin, it's, it's much higher than $140 million. We believe it's closer to between two and $300 million. But even if it was $140 million, as 
the current leadership claims. It's not $20 million a year. It's $20 million the first year, $40 million the second year, $60 million the third year to get to ultimately removing all $140 million. There is no way they can pay for that um, by making it up elsewhere with economic vibrancy in our state. It's just not going to happen that quickly. As you heard probably from the economic uh, uh, presentation yesterday, we're slowly gro growing. We hit bottom, but we're only so slowly growing. And if we have that much extra money to, get, to give back to corporations, why don't we do something like remove the income tax on the Social Security income that so many of our seniors pay? We are ranked the 19th best business tax climate in the country. I can't think of anything else that we're ranked that high in. So we have one of the best business tax climates in the country, and here we go, turn around and give more breaks to businesses, and yet claim we can't give good, healthy raises to state employees and teachers, and we can't do anything for our seniors, and no detail on funding uh, opioid uh, treatment centers. So it's just unacceptable to me to give more breaks to businesses when we're suffering in so many other areas. And another thing that came up is community and technical colleges. And <clears throat> the governor said last night, we need to do everything we can to make sure that that's free. So um, it, there's also this thing about the 13th year of school. What do you see happening in session regarding those issues? Well, that's an area that, you know, I've, I've served as a professional educator for years in adult education and uh, community college type work. And, and, and it's commendable. To, to train our people, we have an undertrained workforce right now. We need to get our, our, our citizens up to speed. We have to retrain some of our coal miners to get back in, 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 into industry. And, and to find ways to do that, you're going to have to pay for it. I know that we've run adult education programs within the public education system for years, and we found ways to do that through federal supplements and things of that sort. That's the bottom line is, it's a great idea, and I fully support tra a well-trained, educated workforce, but someone has to pay for that, and that's going to be the key. You know, he didn't mention any funding source for that, and, and those are kind of some of the things that we're going, to, we're going to be looking very closely. And I know under the budget they had said that $7 million is going to go to that effort, too. Correct. Do you think that that's enough to get this done? You know, it's, it's a good start, I would assume. The, the problem, you know, with our decreasing population and the number of, skill, of work of, of individuals out there to, that could enter our workforce, uh, you know, that, that may work and, and, you know, that could be judged here and there. And if it, if it works good, we should continue. And if it doesn't, you know, we should cut back. Now, the governor also mentioned the opioid epidemic here in West Virginia. Nothing very specific, but that we need to fight this scourge. How do you think we need to do that, in your opinion? <clears throat> well, I think we need to start by creating and funding 90-day treatment facilities, which we don't have here in this state. That's the gold standard by which all, all, all healthcare professionals measure the likelihood of succeeding in treating those who are addicted to substances. And even that success rate certainly isn't even anywhere close to 100 percent. But that's where we have to begin, and we don't have the funding going in that direction at all. And, and nothing that he said last night leads me to believe that's going to happen. And, and again, we're talking about giving corporate tax breaks instead of taking care of the opioid problem by fully funding treatment facilities and detox facilities. And, and he didn't say anything last night that everybody in this state hadn't already heard. It, 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 it seemed to me as if he mentioned it out of an obl obligatory uh, desire, uh, as, as, as not so much as one that he really plans on tackling head on. I just don't see it. I do hear that there's going to be a bill advanced that limits the amount of opioids doctors can prescribe, but in terms of funding treatment centers, which is where we really need to be, I didn't hear it and I don't anticipate that, unfortunately. Senator, what are your thoughts on that? You know, yeah, uh, the speaker is exactly online with that. Uh, that's, a, that's a tremendous problem. And, and we've got to be very cautious. I know that I talked to a doctor today, and he's concerned about that they're, they're going to lower the preponderance of evidence for doctors who prescribe medication, and they're concerned about that, you know. It, it's, just a, it's just a systemic problem in our society that we've got to all get together and work, and nobody has the answer. Uh, we, we've dealt with the drug issues. I can remember when I was the chair of the health committee. Uh, 
you know, we, we dealt with the meth labs and we dealt, dealt uh, with the bath salts and things of that sort. And every time we think we get an edge on it, you know, the, the perpetrators out there are one step ahead of us. So it, it has to be a, a, a joint systemic operation with law enforcement, with the medical community, with our social agencies and things of that sort. And treatment is the key. We, we, we have to have treatment programs. And it has to be more home-based type treatment within our communities. So going back to last night's speech, was there anything that you didn't hear that you wished he would have addressed in the state of the state? Um, you know, I would have liked to have heard him address the issue of removing the Social Security income tax. Um, that's something the Democrats have been trying to advance for the past couple of, past year or more. And, and, and I think it's something that could really help not just our seniors, but our local economies as well. One of the things he didn't mention is, in painting this rosy picture, we halfway through our fiscal year, and we're only halfway through, come well, December 31, we're halfway through, we are $20 million short on our sales tax collections. Well, what that means is money's not being spent in our local communities, in our local businesses to collect those sales taxes. We're behind. To me, that's a true reflection of what's happening in the local economies. And I, and I asked a question about that the other day, and uh, the, the, his, his, uh, Mark Mucow, his financial guy, said that that's because more and more of a person's disposable income is being redirected to health care costs, which you don't collect sales tax on, which is a good thing. But the point is, they're on fixed incomes. More of those fixed incomes are going towards health care needs, and money's not being spent in our local communities. That's not a good thing for economic um, viability. Was there anything that you didn't hear that you wanted to hear? You no, know, I, I was more tuned into the jobs area and, and, it, and the educators. You know, we have 750 non-certified teachers in our state. So, you know, I'm concerned. Education is the foundation of this nation. We've got to put good, qualified teachers in those classrooms. And, and some of the things that I've been hearing is our institutions of higher ed are not preparing that number uh, of, of, of students to be teachers so we can meet our need. And that does concern me. I, you know, that, that's one of the areas that I'm going to be looking very closely. You know, I'd, I'd like to have a conversation with higher education and what, what those teacher programs are and how many are out there and how we're preparing our teachers to go into the workforce to be certified teachers. One of the things that has been a major drawback in that area is obviously the salary. We're, we're, we're at the low end in the nation in salary for teachers and, and you know, young kids that are graduating from high school don't have the incentive to go in. We've cut back on their benefits, and those are areas that concern me. So I'm looking more at the jobs, the education uh, system, the way it works, and how we uh, deliver our education programs. I also wanted to discuss the, uh, the Medicaid issue as well. So apparently, um, as we heard in the budget hearings today, we had overpaid Medicaid, and now we have this extra cash in this fund. Can you guys talk a little bit about this situation? Do you want to go first, Ron? I'll, I'll be glad to. You know, I've been here several years, and I, I can't ever remember when we fully fund Medicaid. You know, we're always scrambling for additional dollars to put into the general revenue so we can match the three-to-one match. Now they're telling us that we overpaid Medicaid by $103 million last year. Well, I, you know, I, I've got to look very closely at the, the, that issue. Uh, if, if we don't put that three, $103 million back in, we're going to lose that three to one match and that's three more hundred million dollars that come back into our Medicaid program to take care of our least vulnerable citizens. And I think it's very important that they, they be spot on in what they're doing with Medicaid. And that's an area that I also look very closely. Another area I wanted to address was the tourism. So we're, the proposal is increasing it from $6 million to $20 million. Do you think that this is doable or that there's any appetite in the Senate and House to do that? There certainly is by the House Democrats, and I think the Senate Democrats will agree as well. Uh, they claim that you get a seven to one return on that investment for every dollar you invest in tourism. So from my perspective, if that is indeed the case, you ought to 
get your hands on every dollar you can and devote it to tourism because every dollar you spend brings seven back. And that it returns that money fairly quickly. So there's absolutely support among the Democrats for that. Whether the House uh, leadership, Republican leadership wants to support it, we don't know yet. Well, thank you guys again so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. Thanks thank for, having, you for us. having us. And that will do it for tonight's program. We'll be back here tomorrow and every weeknight throughout the session. Join us tomorrow for Reporter Roundtable. We'll, we'll discuss the very latest action here at the Capitol. I'm Andrea Lanham. For everyone here at the legislature today, thanks for joining us. Have a good evening.